Uh, good evening everybody welcome to this evening episode of pursue this is pursue 15 k which is hematology erythrocytic diseases we are streaming live from jipmer pondicherry via kolkata and we have two very eminent hematopathologists here i would take the privilege of introducing the moderator which is brigadier tathagat chatterjee who's an mbbs from fmc md pack from fmc nmms PGT in Oncopathology, DM in Hematopathology. Presently, he's the Senior Consultant and Head Hematology, Professor Pathology, Director Lab Services, MS Academics, HOD, IHBT, in the famous ESIC Medical College and Hospital, Faridabad. I would request, sir, to introduce the topic and the speaker. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem. And it's uh, really a proud privilege and an honor to introduce Dr. Devdutt Basu, uh, whom I met in various conferences in Hematocon and various national pathology conferences. And I have always admired him for his depth of knowledge, his simplicity, and his complete command over the subject of pathology and hematology. He is presently the professor and head of pathology at JIPMA, and he's of course an alumni of the famous Maulana Ajad Medical College. He's in fact both an MBBS and an MD from this famous college. And in fact, a few years back when I was taking the National Board of Examination as an external examiner there, I found his name in the roll call of honors and I immediately rang him up and I felt so proud to see his name in the list of the alumni. Now, he needs no introduction. His method of uh, speaking is simplicity. He keeps his uh, language and his knowledge to a very basic level. And at the end of the day, each and every postgraduate student learns and understands the simplicity behind the depth of the knowledge. With over 201 publications, he is an authority. And without much ado, I now hand over to Dr. Professor Devdutt Basu, sir, to start his topic on myelopsychic anemia and leukoerythroblastic blood picture. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Brigadier Chatterjee, and thank you very much, Dr. Nadim, for giving me this opportunity. So, uh, thank you for your kind words. And in the next uh, few minutes, maybe an hour or so, we will uh, deal with the topic. So, I'll start straight with the topic. All right. I hope it's visible to everyone. Yes, sir. All right. Perfect. So the topic for today, leukoerythroblastic blood picture and myelopsychic anemia, two uh, kind of mouthful uh, types of uh, statements to make, leukoerythroblastic and myelopsychic. Uh, I'll, I'll try and make this slightly complicated sounding uh, disorders uh, simple with a case-based approach. So as we say, uh, it's always good to recollect the sound of music and let's start at the very beginning. So let us start with some basic definitions. What is leukoerythroblastic reaction or picture? That's the normal blood smear. You see uh, RBCs, you see platelets, you see lymphocytes and neutrophils. That's what we normally see. If a metamyelocyte gets into that, or if a nucleated RBC gets into it, that's leukoerythroblastic reaction. Presence of immature cells of the myeloid series and nucleated red cells in the circulating blood. Right? It's as simple as that. Historically speaking, this was first described by Weil and Clerk in 1902 in their article on solid tumors. Thereafter, Janet Vaughan in 1936 was, to, was the first to formally define this condition as anemia characterized by the presence in the peripheral blood of immature red cells and a few immature white cells of the myeloid series. In 1966 came this rather significant big article of about 400 patients very well described of leukoerythroblastic anemia and in 1972 Wintrobe himself suggested that anemia should be eliminated from the definition because it is not always present. 
So it's a leukoerythroblastic reaction or a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. So this is how it is defined, right? Presence of a few immature cells in the myeloid series and nucleated red cells in the circulating blood. This is something that I had learned when I was a postgraduate, something that I keep teaching, but I always have a little doubt. And there are three, three questions that I always ask myself as well as I, I want all of you to ask. There is no consensus. How few is few? What do you mean by few? Which immature cells are we talking about, especially in the myeloid series? Is left shift of the neutrophils that we see with uh, acute infections, etc., synonymous with the presence of immature myeloid cells? So let's try and solve these little uh, uh, problems that are there and make, uh, let us understand the whole concept. So if you look at this, there, on the left panel, we see the neutrophil as it matures. There are the C and D other band forms. Now, are they immature granulocytes that we are talking about? How are we talking about the uh, metamyelocytes, myelocytes, and the uh, promyelocytes? Yes. Immature granulocytes, remember, promyelocytes, myelocytes, and metamyelocytes are usually not seen in a normal peripheral blood unless it's a premature infant. So that's important for us to know when we are discussing this concept. In a normal individual, unless it's a premature infant, you do not see these cells in the peripheral blood. Similarly, according to the, w, uh, the ISLH uh, consensus guidelines, a single blast, more than two metamyelocytes, more than a, one myelocyte or promyelocyte, and more than one NRBC is abnormal and has to be reported. So please do not, if you find a smear with lots of band forms and a shift to left, that is not necessarily a leukoerythroblastic picture. You must see the immature cells, metamyelocytes, myelocytes, and promyelocytes to label it as a leukoerythroblastic picture. Similarly, nucleated RBCs, as you know, this is one point, it gives a spurious increase in automated WBC count and can be seen in a wide variety of conditions like hemolytic anemias, neonatal sepsis, leukoerythroblastic blood picture. And when you see more than 10 NRBCs, you need to correct the WBC count and that, that's what we know about. All right. So now there is a little question for all of us. What are nucleated red cells called? Does it have a name? A late normoblast or an uh, intermediate normoblast or what is there in the marrow? When you see a nucleated red cell in the peripheral blood, does it have a name? Yes, it does. And it's called a rubricite. Not very commonly known, but you would if you... Uh, uh, click on rubricide and look at PubMed. There are a couple of articles which still refer to NRBCs as rubricide. This is just a trivia. We generally will call them for the rest of this uh, talk as well as for the rest of your life. Call them as nucleated RBCs. That's fine. Okay. So what is myelophthysic anemia then? So leukoerythroblastic, we understood. Presence of a few uh, NRBCs and few uh, immature granulocytes. What is myelophthysic anemia? The etymology for this is uh, myelo means marrow, thysis means shrinkage of atrophy. It is that type of anemia which is characterized by the presence of immature erythrocytes and leukocytes in the peripheral blood due to infiltration or crowding out of the bone marrow by abnormal cells or tissues. Okay, that, that is what is uh, myelophthysic anemia. It is of a hypoproliferative variant of anemia because it results from inadequate production of blood cells in the marrow and generally speaking, it's normocytic, normochromic type of anemia. Now, before we go into slightly more uh, case-based, let us understand what is it that makes a mature cell, that is RBC and WBCs, come out of the marrow into the peripheral blood. Let us understand the marrow vasculature a bit in detail in order to understand what goes wrong for immature cells to come out. Now, the arterial vessels that enter the marrow, they enter it through the foramina of nutritia and then divide into several arterioles. Small arterioles and capillaries from these vessels span throughout the bone marrow and supply the sinusoids, which are actually a separate entity in themselves, which are interconnected by inter-sinusoidal capillaries. So if you look at this picture, the arrow there points to the arterioles, the, the arterioles whereas the, the small arrowheads in red and blue are the sinuses. These are the sinuses that are traversing throughout. There's an interconnection, multiple arborizing sinuses that are going on throughout the marrow. These sinuses are radially distributed under, uh, around the draining central sinus and they are unique. They are unique because sinusoidal walls, they consist of a single layer of endothelial cell and is devoid of any supporting cell. This, this, it is believed that the surrounding hematopoietic marrow appears to be the major cellular moiety 
that supports the reconstruction and re remodeling of the sinusoidal mi microcirculation. That's how they're different from the vessels, the capillaries, the arterioles, and the veins of the marrow. Sinuses in the liver also have a very similar uh, topography. Now, it's important to also note that it is only the hematopoietic stem cells and the mature cells, that is the red cells and the WBCs, granulocytes, they possess the ability to navigate through the sinuses and come into peripheral circulation because they process certain proteins, okay, which by which they are able to squeeze out through the sinuses and come into the peripheral circulation. The other more immature hematopoietic cells normally cannot come out into the circulation. Okay, so this is what I was discussing yesterday. So let's look at it in a slightly uh, way. Now, so what happens? When we are discussing with the mechanism of a leukoerythroblastic picture, there are three mechanisms that act. As I said, leukoerythroblastic picture means immature cells coming out. Normally, they cannot. So either there is this blood marrow barrier is altered. This is when the disrupted marrow sinusoids are uh, there, and usually it is elicited by the fibrosis that is taking place. The second principle that causes leukoerythroblastosis is accelerated hematopoiesis. When there are too many cells in the marrow, some of the immature cells, like in hemolytic anemias, post-hemorrhage, stress yes, conditions, there is an accelerated hematopoiesis and the excess amount of cells, some of them leak out into the peripheral blood. Both these, altered marrow barrier uh, because of fibrosis as well as accelerated hematopoiesis results in extramedullary hematopoiesis. So whenever there is extramedullary hematopoiesis also, those immature cells that are proliferating in the liver or the spleen also have access to come out into the peripheral blood. So basically there are three mechanisms. Either the marrow marrows get distorted or there is accelerated hematopoiesis. All right, so this is how uh, we understand this. Now, yesterday what happened is I was discussing this at home and my daughter asked me as to what are these high sounding names. So I was trying to give her a picture out of this when she came up with, within some time later she came up with this little cartoon and that she said that is this what happens? Okay, that's the normal scenario. What happens is the inside the marrow house are apparently the precursor cells, the immature cells. You can make out the metamyelocytes by their uh, kidney shaped uh, kind of nucleus and the red cells with the blue are the granulocytes. So they say, wish we could come out or Tata and buy. And the RBC and the polymorph says, don't worry about us. We are ready to fight and we have come out. That, that's normal. So this is what is happening inside the marrow. These are these, are these uh, immature cells, the metamyelocytes, the normoblasts who reside happily inside the marrow. And now comes a situation when suddenly they find that there are too many of them. They stop pushing. Why are there so many of us and what on earth is going on? And then they become overcrowded and someone says, stop pushing you, blast. There is someone, watch it, you are squishing me and this is meta, you are sitting on my head. And outside the RBC and the polymorph are, are just wondering why is there so much noise inside the marrow and the door opens and out spills a few of them. So this is the process of leukoerythroblastic blood picture due to stress and accelerated hematopoiesis. The second scenario is they are again happily living inside the marrow and when suddenly there are these extraneous people who have come in. They are, they are, they are planning to infiltrate the marrow house and there is this whole lot of ugly looking cells and human beings along with these blue apparently fibrosis. All that is happening and the poor immature, the precursor cells are pushed out into the blood. So that is the cause for leukoerythroblastic blood picture due to marrow infiltration and myelophthysis. Okay, enough of cartoons. Let's get back to the reality. Now, the, the basic talk that I'm going to do right now is based on two of our experiences of leukoerythroblastic blood picture. The one on the left panel is my old thesis, which uh, thanks to Dr. Tejinder Singh's influence in my life, I still carry it around with me and the lesson that I have learned. My thesis was on micrometastasis in breast cancer in the marrow. And with the 11 patients that turned positive, that had marrow involvement, four of them had a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. This other article on the right is something that we've done in JIPMA some years back. And again, there were 23 patients with marrow metastasis of non-hematopoietic malignancies. And as many as six of them had leukoerythroblastic uh, picture. Uh, well, also in our study, it was seen that patients whose hemoglobin was 10 grams or more uh, did not have a leukoerythroblastic picture. So, Leukoerythroblastic picture generally has a poorer outcome and has a potency for 
a poorer outcome in the sense okay so presence of leukoblastic anemia also correlated with a marrow fibrosis so now that we have got how do we approach a peripheral smear uh, when we are dealing with such cases so let's look at it one by one when you look at the rbcs normocytic normochromic by and large the rbcs in any of these conditions myelophysic anemia is normocytic normochromic but do look out for nrbcs if there are nuclear rbcs how many i hope you know how to count the nuclear rbcs now even the cell counters are able to give it but otherwise you know how many nrbcs are present per 100 wbcs also while you are looking at the nuclear rbcs try and look out what stage they are in are they the late normoblasts or they are intermediate or early that has a significance we'll discuss that in a while polychromatic cells are there too many polychromatic cells or no if there are lots of polychromatic cells and nrbcs you probably dealing with a hemolytic anemia as a cause for your leukoblastic blood picture look for anisopoikilocytosis and two major anisopoikilocytosis that we uh, look at are dacryocyte or tear drop cells okay that that is very important when you are approaching a case of myelophysic anemia tear dropping is usually referred to as a uh, when there is marrow fibrosis also look whether schistocytes are present or not schistocytes also at times are very significant the finding in the peripheral blood any other specific change you have a leukoblastic picture and you are seeing a sickle cell so your diagnosis is almost made it's basically a sickle cell disease that is causing the leukoblastosis in the wbcs again the counts are important in myelophysic anemia generally there is leukopenia but that is no hard and fast rule you can get wbcs with normal counts you can get wbcs with increased counts so there is nothing very uh, it could be anything the differential count is important how many myelocytes how many metamyelocytes you're seeing uh, how many uh, myelocytes how many promyelocytes are there if there are too many blasts then of course your diagnosis is most likely to be an acute leukemia if you find what is called that blast window or a hiatus you're seeing blasts and you're seeing neutrophils it's most likely to be a leuk that you're dealing with whereas in a true myelophysic anemia you do not really get too many blasts you get more of the myelocytes metamyelocytes or up to promyelocytes okay so that's doing a good differential count is important looking for hypersegmentation at times a frank uh, severe megaloblastic anemia may manifest with myelophysic uh, may manifest with a leukoblastic picture platelets platelets are usually normal could be reduced in severe types of myelophysic anemia so count is important morphology bizarre morphology of platelets or megakaryocyte fragments in the peripheral blood would tell take you towards a myelofibrosis type of a picture so once we do this let us find out so this is a general picture of the various possibilities that can occur in a myelophysic anemia or leukoblastic blood picture so you have an isopoikilocytosis you have tear drop cells you can have a few polychromatic cells you can have a blast or you can have a shift the myelocytes and metamyelocytes and nrbcs so what is the general differential diagnosis of a leukoblastic blood picture once we do this once we know the possible causes of leukoblastosis our case based approach will be easier so first and foremost the commonest cause even with us as well as in most of the thing is basically neoplastic infiltration of the marrow by non most of it is non hematopoietic that is metastasis lymphomas myelomas and acute lymphoblastic leukemias also may cause uh, a leukoerythroblastic picture especially all now again we'll go into that the next are the non neoplastic infiltrative disorders like bone marrow granuloma storage cell secondary fibrosis occurring in sle and osteopathies could lead on to leukoerythroblastic picture myeloproliferative neoplasms particularly primary myelofibrosis Of course you have cases of mastocytosis MDS AML which causes marrow fibrosis and then moving out of the uh, cells and then of course this group of acute hemolysis like sickle cell crisis thalassemia severe megaloblastic anemia severe infection post hemorrhagic regenerating marrow early phases of myelonecrosis all of these would lead to uh, presence of because of the hyperproliferation presence of the uh, immature cells in the peripheral blood so with this little background i hope we can now move ahead and discuss a few cases to see what were the common causes of uh, leukoblastosis and myelophysic anemia 
So let's do some of those which is because of myelophthysis truly, whereas marrow infiltration has occurred. So we have this 59-year-old male, backache and severe anemia was his basic presentation. His hemoglobin was 6.5, TLC was low, 3.5, platelets of 45,000. And this is what we saw in the peripheral blood. All right, so what are you seeing? As you can see yourself, predominantly normocytic, normochromic, maybe a few polychromatic cells, not too many. And you have an NRBC there, and on the right-hand panel, you have a metamyelocyte. So this was the differential uh, peripheral smear report normocytic, normochromic, and you see there were four myelocytes, five metamyelocytes, and four NRBCs per 100 WBCs. Platelets were reduced, commensurating with your... So again, a typical leucoroblastic blood picture. So bone marrow aspiration in such a situation is warranted because of pancytopenia and leucoroblastosis, and the marrow showed metastatic adenocarcinoma cells, right? Lots of... Uh, infiltrate by malignant epithelial cells, small size cells, not too big, uh, somewhere forming little glands or tubules and also on the right hand panel notice there is this osteoclast, right. This was the biopsy, again desmoplasia, fibrosis and caught up in it are small groups of cells, somewhere some minor gland formation and a prostate specific antigen was uh, positive in that. So this was a case, this was a case of a prostatic adenocarcinoma that metastasized to the marrow as a carcinoma of unknown primary and one of the common causes for uh, metastasis and leukoarthroblastic blood picture. This was an 85 year old lady, known case of a carcinoma breast but that was 15 years ago and she presented with a pathological fracture of the hip, lytic lesions were seen in the pelvis and it was query query, myeloma was the clinical uh, differential. Again. Hemoglobin was 5, TLC was in this case slightly on the higher side, platelets were 95,000 and again the peripheral blood showed an RBCs, quite a few nucleated RBCs and therefore in this particular case we had to uh, resort to correcting the TLC and again immature myeloid cells. So this was a microcytic hypochromic RBCs, probably nutritional and there were 6, meta, uh, six myelo, 10 metamyelocytes, 24 nuclear RBCs. Now for all of you who are uh, training yourselves to be pathologists, morphologists, please do a proper differential count. Uh, not always rely on the cell counter, that's fine. Cell counter gives us very good uh, correlation with the differential count. But try and do so that you can identify these immature cells and be confident about it. Again, aspirate uh, showed uh, adenocarcinoma cells and this was the biopsy. Okay, so that was a case of carcinoma breast record 15 years later, but still it was a carcinoma breast. The third case was that of a 74-year-old man, increasing pallor and melina. Again, hemoglobin 5, TLC 4,500, borderline low platelets, 10 metamyelocytes, few NRBCs in uh, the smear. And this was what the aspirate was. Large cells, slightly discrete abundant cytoplasm and the blackish pigment in the cytoplasm, this is an old case, and subsequently a melanoma of the anal canal was detected in this patient. So a melanoma metastatic to the marrow was the diagnosis. This was an interesting case. It was a young male, 22-year male, backache and severe anemia. Hemoglobin low, pancytopenia again, shift to left, not very, very, uh, myelocyte 3, metamyelocyte 8, neutrophil 75, 5 NRBCs, but if you look at this smear, I'll show you big better pictures, something that is striking in this picture, which was not there in the previous cases, yes, that's schistocytes. If you look at it on a closer look, there were lots of fragmented RBCs. Schistocytes almost giving rise to a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia uh, type of a picture. All right, so this was what we signed it out as, microangiopathic, kindly rule out a microangiopathic, but with a leukoarthroblastic picture, there were NRBCs, there were... Uh, metamyelocytes, lots of it. So because we called it as a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, they investigated him on those lines. The coagulation profile was essentially normal. There was no jaundice, renal parameters was normal. And in view of the leukoarthroblastic blood picture, severe anemia, we did a bone marrow. And to our kind of shock and surprise, we saw metastatic mucine secreting adenocarcinoma. 22-year-old male, mind you. This was the bone marrow biopsy showing a lot of osteolysis going on the bone and you have these glands full of mucin, 
some area showing a lot of desmoplasia. Again, glandular pattern, almost a well to moderately differentiated. Also notice the sinuses. The sinuses there are so many full of uh, malignant cells. There's kind of lymphovascular embolization within the marrow itself and extensive amount of fibrosis. So Musicarmin, cytokeratin 7 was positive, 20 negative. So we hinted at possibly get a primary upper GI as the primary uh, site. And this patient did have a ulcer in the stomach, which turned out to be a adenocarcinoma, moderately differentiated. Subsequent to this patient, we have reported about seven or eight such in the last few years of young males with uh, GI malignancy, especially of the upper GI, that is stomach, some with colonic, who presented with a microangiopathic uh, anemia and leucoerythroblastic blood picture. These are some of the other examples of various types and various patterns of metastasis that we have seen, so ranging from well differentiated to moderately differentiated. That upper right corner is one of my own thesis uh, pictures to very poorly differentiated carcinomas. All of it can be seen in the marrow. So tumors that metastasize to marrow in adults generally, initially I thought it was breast because I did a thesis on that, but looking at our data also and reading around, it's the GIT that is taking over gastric, colonic, breast, prostate, thyroid follicular. The upper right photograph is of a uh, case of follicular carcinoma of the thyroid in the marrow. The lower two is a signet ring type of carcinomas from the GI uh, with a musicum in positivity. Small cell carcinomas of the lung, we have seen melanomas, we have seen squamous cell carcinomas of the lung and very other, many other round cell tumors. Uh, <clears throat> just a few words on uh, how a metastasis uh, looks. You could get what you see on the top left is a very small foci of malignancy or you could get part of the marrow involved. The bottom two pictures are showing almost near total replacement uh, of uh, the marrow. Now, when you have such near total replacement of the marrow, obviously the hematological profile goes down. These are the patients that present with uh, maybe severe leucoerythroblastic picture or even pancytopenia. So hematologically or prognostically, the extent of marrow involvement is important to note. What is tumor myelopathy? Tumor myelopathy are changes in the bone marrow microenvironment and overall cellularity and topography in response to a tumor infiltration. These may be nonspecific, but contain a lot of cellular changes and stromal and mesenchymal changes. Once we study this, we are able to appreciate the basic changes or the disruption of the blood and the marrow barrier. And that, that's what we can, I'll show you a few pictures. These are some of the, again, all derived from my thesis that I did around 30 years ago. All derived, uh, <coughs> these are the changes that were seen. Lymphoid aggregates, non-specifically. Reactive lymphoid proliferation is known. Plasma cytosis is seen. Eosinophilia is seen. And megakaryocytic hyperplasia. Neutrophilic abscesses. So any kind of cellular changes can be seen in, in the vicinity of the tumor uh, within the marrow. These are the stromal changes. Sinusoidal dilatation angiogenesis, new blood vessel forming, almost, fibroblastic proliferation to extensive myelofibrosis. Bone remodeling is again, this also explains to us the various uh, radiological findings that we get. Osteoblastic proliferation, neo-osteogenesis is there, osteosclerosis, osteoporosis, all kinds of changes can occur in the stroma of the bone marrow and resulting in a lot of hematological consequences of that. Myelofibrosis, both grade 2 and grade 3, is often seen with uh, tumors. Moving on to some more uh, types of metastasis, it's in a younger age group now. This was a 13-year-old girl whose basic complaint was inability to swallow for three months, bilateral proptosis, infiltrating mass in the ob orbit, nasal sinus, and posterior pharynx. She was severely pale but did not have lymph nodes or hepatosplenomegaly. Hemoglobin, 6 pancytopenia again, TLC 1400, platelets 34,000, and again, a lot of NRBCs, and first, now you notice teardrop cells, okay, here and there you see teardrop cells. Okay. This was the bone marrow aspirate. First look, we thought it was leukemia, but then yes, of course, we see the uh, crowding and the uh, clustering of the cells, and this is what? Obviously, you see an attempted clustering of the cells, so that is quite unlikely to be a leukemic uh, blast. 
you even see rosette formation in both these cells, the low power and the high power, showing nice rosetting. And this turned out to be a small round cell tumor infiltration. And this was the bone marrow. Again, notice the bony remodeling that's going on. Too much of osteoclastic, osteosclerotic bone there. Fibrosis is there and caught up in it are these round cells. In, literally in sheets, fair amount of rosette formation. And again, another one showing stromal change along with a lot of tumor cells. These were positive for PAS, IPAR view, positive for CD99, fly one positive, and this was a small round cell tumor infiltration. Finally, we gave out a diagnosis of PNP net. TDT and CD34 are negative. So this is one uh, thing that may mimic a leukocorrhal lymphoma infiltration. So keep that in mind always. Sixth case is a three-year-old boy. Proptosis for three months, listlessness and bone pain and severe pallor. Many of these clinically also mimic uh, leukemias. And peripheral blood was again florid leukoblastic picture, including blasts. All right. There were a couple of blasts in this, a lot of NRVCs, and uh, this is how it was. Again, infiltration by small round cell tumor, clusters of them, large amount of them. And to the left, you see something that is kind of diagnostic. When you see the pinkish amorphous fibrillary material, you know you're probably dealing with a neuroblastoma. So that's the neuropil present. Another field showing these pink neuropil-like substances with uh, small round cells, uh, metastatic. This was the trephine biopsy. Again, almost entire marrow was replaced by these uh, cells, neuropil present, cells showing kind of a rosetting around the blood vessel. Synaptophysin, NSC, chromogranin were positive, and we gave, finally, this patient had a retroperitoneal mass. BMA was increased. He was treated as a neuroblastoma stage 4, and I have presented this case earlier also. Unfortunately, this child, two years later down the road, uh, developed AML, therapy-related AML, and expired. So neuroblastoma is one of the commonest uh, childhood tumors to metastasize to the marrow. And uh, if you look at literature, more than 50% of cases have at some point of time marrow involvement. Often it is the first site of diagnosis. And stage 4C, uh, 4S, uh, sorry, stage 4S is a, though a stage 4 disease, but if less than 10% of the area in the marrow is involved, it is only, if only the marrow is involved in that to less than 10%, though it is stage 4, 4S has a good prognostic sign. Seventh is another child, two-year-old boy, mass in the orbital region with neck nodes. Again, very similar. Uh, blasts were there. Lots of NRBCs were there. And uh, again, uh, again, in such a situation, you'll have to correct the TLC. It's probably much less than 12,800. And these were the cells, very bizarre uh, cells. Uh, if you can make it out, almost one tadpole-like cell, large cell with striations. And this was positive for Desmin on the... Uh, immunocytochemistry that we did in the aspirate, the trephine biopsy was desmin positive and we called it an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. So marrow metastasis in childhood, commonest is neuroblastoma. Evelings, embryonal rhabdo, we've even seen cases of medulloblastoma, retinoblastoma, rarely Wilms tumor is, in, is being picked up. The differential diagnosis, importance for us to note this is that this is often a differential diagnosis for leukemia and lymphoma, clinically as well as, especially those that present with primary in the marrow, uh, primarily in the marrow, clinically as well as morphologically, one has to be careful. The next case is a 40-year male. We'll just move on to some. Uh, this was a 40-year male with lethargy and abdominal pain. Pallor with cervical lymph and adenopathy. There was a 2-centimeter cervical node, but that, unfortunately, the FNAC was not diagnostic. Ultrasound presented with multiple abdominal nodes. Hemoglobin was 7, TLC was low, platelets were adequate, and again, a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. And this is what the marrow showed. Notice on the right-hand side is a marrow which is near normal, right? Fat spaces are there, but the left-hand side appears to be infiltrated. There are small lymphocytes, and if you look carefully, again, if you look carefully, there were areas where, again, a lot of vasculature, lymphocytes, and some large cells staring at you here and there. And there were these large cells with prominent nucleolus, and again, another one, prominent nucleolus, binucleated large cell hidden amongst the uh, various inflammatory cells, do a CD30, and we diagnosed it as a Hodgkin lymphoma. The Hodgkin lymphoma, of course, nowadays, because of advance, uh, advent of the PET CT, we are not getting too many bone marrows for staging. 
but when it was done about 10% of hodgkins uh, lymphoma did show uh, marrow involvement and to our uh, experience uh, it is the nodular sclerosis though the books say make cellularity or lymphocyte depleted we have seen many cases of nodular sclerosis showing marrow involvement at times it forms an incidental diagnosis you pick up it on the marrow first and then uh, whenever suppose it's a retroperitoneal lymph node mass or a other site marrow is often the first possibility and it's fibrosis and necrosis is quite common in hodgkins and therefore the aspiration yield is poor in our study that we had published out of 14 cases of hodgkins none were picked up on the aspirate leukoblastic picture was seen this picture that i am showing you is one of those rare imprint that we have picked up on rsl otherwise till date i think in an aspirate i have not really seen a convincing reach done by cell there's so much of fibrosis that the aspirates often don't yield much material this was on an imprint that we picked up an rsl in a particular case this was a 45 year old ma man breathlessness and fatigability pallor plus spleen of 8 cm so now we come to some of the causes of leukoblastosis with splenomegaly spleen of 8 cm liver of 7 cm so with this kind of picture the clinical diagnosis was cml straight okay however the uh, peripheral blood was not like that hemoglobin was low this uh, was anemic tlc was only 10500 platelets of 85000 and this is what the ps showed okay tear drop cells occasional nrbc a metamyelocyte there and it also showed circulating plasma cell so there was a metamyelocytes there was an occasional blast and occasional plasma cell was also identified so this marrow when you did the when we did the aspirate of the imprint touch showed sheets of myeloma cells plasma cells okay the aspirate was diluted imprint was 65% binucleated with a few blastic morphology there notice the prominent nucleolus the large cell the marrow was packed there were abnormal myeloma cells and you can make out the very prominent nucleolus in most of them reticulin was increased that is why probably there was hepatosplenomegaly cd138 was positive this was lambda light chain restricted and a diagnosis of multiple myeloma was given and further it was confirmed on uh, serum electrophoresis so myeloma also can produce a leukoblastic picture and our study also some years back we published it uh, fibrosis is known in myeloma in about 20% of the cases and in all these cases the plasma cell burden is underestimated in the aspirate because of fibrosis you don't get out too many leukocytopenias and leukoblastic pictures are common and this kind of fibrosis correlates well with poorly differentiated mitotic activity as well as the median survival of these patients somewhat related patient another one 65 year lady who had now renal problems pedal edema urinary proteinuria hemoglobin low platelets low tlc okay shift to left bone marrow was aspirated but uh, diluted but had about 45% plasma cells this was the biopsy again notice okay now i'm sure you'll be able to pick up that's the bony trabecule a bit of it and you see this kind of eosinophilic material that is present all right so this was a case of at places it was frank eosinophilic amorphous deposits so this was a case of positive for congo red an apple green birefringence and this was a case of myeloma with extensive amyloidosis so in myeloma fibrosis and amyloidosis can result in this myelopathic type of picture and leukoblastic blood picture though relatively uncommon now we move to a 65 year old lady with massive splenomegaly pallor massive splenomegaly is that spleen which goes beyond the umbilicus pancytopenia and now these are not from this particular patient but i wanted to see four different peripheral smears that i have projected out all showing characteristic what is a tear drop cell or a dacryocyte all right so all the four this is the picture of a dacryocyte nrbc's occasional blasts in both the uh, peripheral smears this is the picture again you can see as i told you when you look at the wbc's look at all the cells do a good differential count and you also spot a basophil so again the right hand panel shows very bizarre abnormal platelets along with the tear drop rbcs so this is the picture actually the peripheral smear of that particular case and nrbcs t 
teardrop RBCs and blasts. So we are in such a situation when you see points to note. Big spleen, teardrop cells, leukopenia, left shift with a few blasts. Not just only neutrophils and blasts, but there is a spectrum. You see metamyelocytes, myelocytes, uh, promyelocytes and a few blasts. Look for basophilia, abnormalities in the platelet. All these point out to possibly a myeloproliferative neoplasm like myelofibrosis, which is causing these changes. This was the aspirate was as bad, but the imprint had these very bizarre megakaryocytes all over. Few blasts, myeloid cells were there. Erythropoiesis was kind of suppressed. And this was the trephine biopsy. Again, a cellular trephine biopsy, but notice some dilated sinusoids, lots of megakaryocytes, abnormal looking megakaryocytes. And this is the typical picture, hyperchromatic megakaryocytes in clusters along with a myeloid spectrum of cells, erythropoiesis suppressed, and you're moving towards the diagnosis of primary myelofibrosis. All right? Again, have a look at the bizarre-looking megakaryocytes that you have here. And this is, uh, of course, I don't see it too often. This particular case showed very, very abnormal. Remember the, the immature cells coming out of the sinuses into the peripheral blood? It was reflected here. Each of these sinuses were all dilated and filled with megakaryocytes. Reticulin was increased, trichrome was positive. CD34 we did just to isolate because at times there could be an accelerated phase in myelofibrosis, but this again highlights the vasculature, the sinusoidal dilatation. And notice in this again, this was, I mean, I am, this particular patient also had a testicular mass and the testicular FNAC that was done was just full of megakaryocytes. It was possibly a kind of an extramedullary hematopoiesis that was going on. And this was a picture that I can show. You see the sinuses distended and filled with megakaryocytes. This is how they are moving out of circulation. Now, extramedullary hematopoiesis would happen in the spleen and you would get megakaryocyte fragments and bizarre looking platelets in the peripheral blood. So primary myelofibrosis is that which does not have a preceding type of myeloproliferative neoplasm with massive spleen. Thrombocytosis can be the initial presentation. Anemia is there. And most cases of primary myelofibrosis, whatever be the phase, present with a definite leukoerythroblastic picture. And these are, these are typical three signs of myeloproliferative myelofibrosis, the tear dropping and leukoerythroblastic picture, the dilated sinusoids and the increased fibrosis. Remember, there's so much of fibrosis that normally the sinuses, which are normally not visible so clearly in a normal marrow, they're collapsed. But because of the fibrosis stretching it, the sinuses kind of dilate and stare at you. There are three phases of myelofibrosis. You're all aware of it. Hypercellular, overt and sclerotic phase. And in about 5 to 30 percent of patients, a transformation to blastocysts may take place. And this is the cellular phase of myelofibrosis identified by the typical appearance of the megakaryocytes and some amount of streaming of the cells to show you might get, if you do a reticulant, it would be grade one. Again, Increased fibrosis is almost getting to be an overt myelofibrosis, but you still see some residual hematopoietic cells hanging around and dilated sinuses. More overt, more of fibrosis, a few entrapped residual megakaryocytes are there. This has gone beyond the overt into the sclerotic, osteosclerotic phase. And finally, you get new osteogenesis. And this is, this is how uh, the spectrum of changes that occur in myelofibrosis. This was a case of polycythemia, known for the last 10 years, polycythemia vera. The last one year, there was this refractory anemia with the hemoglobin ranging around 6 to 7. A big spleen and peripheral blood showed. Again, NRBCs, megakaryoblasts and blasts and promyelocytes, okay, apart from the leukoerythroblastic picture. And this was the bone marrow. Again, here you see kind of a trilineage type of uh, Pan myelosis is there. You have normoblasts, you have islands of that, you have myelocytes, and these large, loosely clustered megakaryocytes. You look at it again, there is a cellular pan myelosis going on, but focus of fibrosis has set in. So, this was a case of a spent phase of polycythemia vera, which has gone into a fibrotic phase. Again, later stage of polycythemia vera, when it goes into fibrosis, can manifest with myelophysic anemia. This is again another interesting case, a very non-specific history this gentleman had. He was a 50-year-old engineer who came with just non-specific back a lower pain. Peripheral blood, though the counts were essentially normal, 
apart from eosinophilia there was this leukoerythroblastic blood picture back pain leukoerythroblastic blood picture he was thought of as myeloma but his esr was normal there was no band but x ray showed a lytic lesion there were lytic lesions small ones in both l3 and in the pelvis and the aspirate here and there we saw what are these mast cells all right and this was the biopsy overall a mildly hypocellular kind of fragment but there were two large areas of cells which were visible on uh, either side of the uh, trephine that we did with fibrosis and when you looked into the higher magnification of that you saw a lot of spindled out cells lots of spindle cells forming whorls around the bony trabeculae here and there a few eosinophils and this is toluidine blue positive cd117 positive mast cell tryptase positive and a diagnosis of sorry a diagnosis of mast cell uh, mastocytosis was made in this patient again causing fibrosis and leukoerythroblastic picture you can also see patients with long standing renal failure with leukoerythroblastic blood picture you no know, renal osteodystrophy changes peritrabecular fibrosis often increased reticulin such patients may also manifest with uh, leukoerythroblastosis now let's move on to some uh, cases in children let's let's see we discussed the entire gamut of neoplastic disorders in adults and in childhood now let's look at some non neoplastic cases in children there was this 3 month old child with massive hepatosplenomegaly anemic child with failure to thrive and when you see a child with a big spleen you tend to call it as a storage disorder hemoglobin was 3 there was pancytopenia and there was obvious tear drop cells metamyelocytes and myelocytes and again a, a kind of a leukoerythroblastic blood picture aspirate was dry totally dry and this was the bone marrow focal areas of hypercellular uh, proliferative marrow but you notice the bony trabeculae were kind of enlarged dilated cartilage was kind of present and this was what rest of the area showed very irregular cartilage in a thing with lots of islands or arborizing islands of uh, osteoblastic and as well as osteoclastic activity again another picture there's hardly any marrow space you know it's as if the bone is growing into the marrow so we ordered an x ray and this is what it showed typical appearance of what is called osteoporosis hardly any medullary canal visible osteopetrosis sorry marble bone disease or albershonberg disease it's rare but results in infantile anemia hepatosplenomegaly repeated fractures and invariably the child presents with pancytopenia tear drop cells and leukoerythroblastic blood picture okay another child this time a 16 year old girl with massive hepatosplenomegaly hemoglobin is 8 again you have a peripheral blood leukoerythroblastic picture here let's see there are quite a few neutrophils and a shift cell and an rbc sorry for the quality of the photograph is pretty old uh, picture of mine and this is what the aspirate showed again very cellular aspirate but notice these large cells abundant uh, cytoplasm and in higher magnification you can make them out to be uh, storage cells and if you look at it carefully you can find out the typical crumpled tissue paper appearance so this was a case of gaucher disease that's the typical appearance of a gaucher cell pa is positive pearl stain positive and this was the trephine biopsy again lots of uh, storage cells only a uh, kind of a uh, fibrillary cytoplasm in the cells again another area again the typical uh, tissue paper crumpled appearance is visible so gaucher disease was the diagnosis another 3 year old child with delayed milestones elder sibling also died at the age of 4 with severe anemia born of consanguineous marriage massive spleen cherried red spot again storage disease is suspected you look at the peripheral blood and you find pancytopenia with uh, left shift and occasional nrbc the marrow again shows classical findings this is a very this is the cellular uh, fragment but notice the clear clear spaces around it and if you look on close magnification you find these foamy macrophages Okay, again, the high power of the foamy macrophages, foaminess of the cytoplasm is visible. Again, another field. Again, large cells, but with foamy cytoplasm, uh, and this is a diagnosis of a name and pick disease. This is again a case that I have shown many a times before. A one-year-old child with regressed milestones, irritability, and failure to thrive. 
massively enlarged liver and spleen. Again, similar morphological features of NRBCs, etc. It's in the, the peripheral blood, the lymphocytes showed these cytoplasmic vacuoles. And again, marrow was full of these macrophages with very, very coarse kind of vacuoles and large cells. And notice the difference between the Neyman pick and this is very big coarse grand vacuoles. Again, clusters of them. Very large, prominent vacuoles in the cytoplasm. And this is what we expect in uh, more of like the mucopalisaccharide and that group of diseases. With this history, we just, when we saw these vacuoles, we thought, let's get a abdominal x-ray done and true enough you find the bilateral calcification of the adrenals the ultrasound also showed calcified adrenals and a diagnosis of Wallman disease was made deficiency of cholesterol ester hydrolases often as neurological deficits hepatosplenomegaly with bilateral adrenal calcification so lysosomal storage disorders almost all when they are extensively involved present with some kind of hematological abnormality uh, we had again a series of cases that we have reported where leukoerythroblastic blood picture was seen in about one-fifth of the cases. Okay, so about 20% of the cases. And these are the three cells that we commonly encounter. We see a lot of Nyman pick in this part of the country. Gaucher is seen as well as we have reported a few cases of Wallman and other uh, mucopolysaccharidosis also. This was an 18-year-old male, 18-year uh, case number 18, or the two-and-a-half-year-old uh, boy with bilateral ear discharge and rashes and again there was this leukoerythroblastic blood picture kind of florid one with a raised TLC and a liver and spleen as well as lymphadenopathy peripheral blood uh, showed uh, these again cells which uh, looked histiocytic slightly elongated nucleus abundant cytoplasm the biopsy was better in the sense we were able to identify the eosinophils we were able to see the grooved nuclei and a Langerhans cell finally CD1A S100 being positive, we gave a diagnosis of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So that brings us to the uh, the next group of disorders which often cause uh, uh, leukoerythroblastic blood picture. A uh, 24-year-old male, fever for two months, loss of weight with hepatosplenomegaly, again normocytic normochromic anemia shift to left, NRBCs, aspirate was done, pretty cellular aspirate, but showed only reactive changes. There was a bit of plasma cytosis, toxic change in the neutrophils, nothing uh, great about it. But the biopsy was this. You had this granulomas, yes. Tuberculous granulomas can cause a florid leukoerythroblastic picture, again, because of associated fibrosis. So this was a higher magnification of the granuloma that we picked up. This is an old slide of mine. So granulomatous inflammation can be quite Tuberculosis can have varied uh, manifestation in the marrow and this is another case where it, more of caseous necrosis was visible rather than florid granulomas and here and there if you look an acid was bacilli was seen. Today, coincidentally, we picked up one other case and uh, I'm thankful to my postgraduate who clicked the pictures immediately and uh, sent it. It was a case of a PLHA that is uh, a patient with AIDS and uh, diarrhea, pancytopenia, shift to left nucleated RBCs and this was the aspirate, low magnification. Notice a cluster of foamy macrophages in the paratrabicular area. On higher magnification, this is what was seen. Lots of otherwise hematopoiesis was not too bad. It was there, here and there, large cells. Strongly positive for acid pass bacillus. And when you see such intracytoplasmic uh, location of acid pass bacilli, it's often tempted to do a pass stain. and. Interestingly, or very, we were excited about this fact that this was so beautifully pass positive. Now, this tells us that this is not possibly mycobacterium tuberculosis, but maybe atypical mycobacteriosis like mycobacterium avium intracellular. So that those are the ones which are both positive for AFB, uh, that is Zn stain, as well as for PAS. So again, a slide that I have shown multiple amount of time. Again, on bone marrow aspirate and imprint you can see what are called negative images of the bacilli, especially in immunosuppressed patients. Uh, these are often possible to be detected and you do a, a ZN stain and you find them to be uh, all over the uh, cells. So again, a cell that I have shown multiple number of times, it's a macrophage with plenty of negative images. Uh, this causes the pseudo-gotcher-like appearance and this is teeming with acid-fast bacilli. 
So mycobacterium tuberculosis or atypical mycobacteriosis, when it infiltrates the marrow, it often leads to a myeloptic type of anemia. In another case, there are these very well-defined granulomas, extremely well-defined granulomas, possibly tuberculosis, but this is what sarcoid granulomas look like. And this is one stain that I'd like to show you the slide. This is why there is so much of fibrosis in whenever there is a granulomatous reaction. Extensive amount of marrow fibrosis, not around just around the granulomas, but also generally. And this is what leads to the myelophthesis that goes on. This was a 35-year-old farmer, fever for 10 days, left-sided headache for four months, cough with mucopurulent expectoration, pallor, clubbing of fingers, cervical lymph nodes and meningeal signs were there. Severely anemic, 2.5 grams, MCB was raised, TLC was normal, left shift, NRBCs were there, platelets were reduced, ESR was raised. Again, aspirate was not very successful, but we could spot a few things. You notice these macrophages, histiocytes, and caught up in them are those yeast, like rounded structures with a little pale halo around them, uh, kind of pinkish, and that was cryptococcus. And this was the biopsy, well-formed granuloma, a couple of them were there. And on closer inspection, you see these yeast forms of cyst like little bubbles they look all over. When you do, what stain do we do? We do a mucicarmen. That's one of the fungi which stains for mucicarmen, nicely positive. The reticulin stain that we did for demonstrating the fibrosis also picked up beautiful cryptococcal yeast. Okay, so this was a disseminated cryptococcosis. CSF was also positive for this patient. He ultimately was an HIV positive individual. So granulomas, disseminated granulomatous inflammation in the marrow elicits fibrosis and myelophthesis. Often results in cytopenia and leukoerythroblastic picture. Any of these uh, cases could cause granulomas and uh, lead to uh, fibrosis and lead to uh, anemia. So now let's look at that group of disease where there is too many of the cells that are glowing inside. Now these are the cases which probably don't need a marrow because they are they are uh, diagnostic in themselves. And so let's take up one by one, of course. So leukoerythroblastic blood picture due to stress or accelerated hematopoiesis. This was a 32-year male, severe pallor epistaxis, hemoglobin was 4, TLC was 4,500, platelets were 12,000. Again, I'll show you the photograph of the peripheral blood. What do you notice in this peripheral blood? In the upper end, you see a nuclear RBC, and lower end, you see blast. Okay, we looked at this smear, and there were blasts and NRVCs and mature neutrophils. The intermediary cells were not seen. So this gives you a clue to the fact that possibly I'm dealing with a sub-leukemic luke. Okay, so when you do, so this was what the picture was, there lots of blasts were there, no intermediary cell. Okay, so then you go ahead, do a marrow and do your immunophenotype. This was a, a case of an acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So in these acute leukemias also, the, the blasts proliferate in the marrow and result in the displacement of the immature cells into the peripheral blood. Mind you, at times you get a nice leukoerythroblastic uh, shift to left. So in a case of uh, ALL in the smear, you might get a myelocyte, you might get a promyelocyte also coming out of the marrow. And if you do your myeloperoxidase stain or Sudan black, those cells, the myeloid cells may turn positive and create diagnostic problems for you. You might think that is blast. So keep a good lookout for whether you are dealing with really blasts or whether what is staining for myeloperoxidase and um, uh, Sudan Black B or whatever you do are actually immature myeloid cells that have come out as a result of the myelophthesis that goes on. So that, that's one little uh, caveat that is there for acute leukemia with, myelo, uh, with myelophthesis. So this is case of acute leukemia often causes, this is what I said again, due to flooding of blasts in the marrow, both AL and AML. However, there are some. Now, for instance, if you look at this peripheral smear, this is of course not mine taken from the net. This, this has an RBCs, but this has a florid blast. So you would not call this as a uh, leukoerythroblastic picture. This is definitely a case with acute leukemia. However, the, some acute leukemias do have fibrosis. Literature says 30%. I'm not sure. I have not seen so many acute leukes. But yes, some of them are. Acute panmyelosis with myelofibrosis. Acute myel megakaryoblastic leukemia often have fibrosis as a component of the disease. AML with myelodysplastic related changes or a primary myelofibrosis of CML in a blast phase may show fibrosis and a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. Another case, 
a jaundice in a newborn and uh, hemoglobin is 13 which is low for a newborn mcv is raised which is okay tlc is 86000 platelets are 222000 and this is the blood picture that you see now you see lots of nrvcs and you see lots of spherocytes also okay so this is not truly speaking a myelophysic anemia this is a leukoerythroblastic blood picture due to some type of hemolysis and in a newborn you would think of a hemolytic disease of newborn both abo incompatibility as well as rh incompatibility can manifest in this form with lots and lots of nrbcs coming out okay so the nrbcs overpowered the wbcs the 250 and you have a myelocyte metamyelocytes lots of them so this is the the leukoerythroblastic picture due to overcrowding or too many hyperproliferation of the marrow okay again when you are dealing with a newborn remember again i am telling you premature kids if the baby is premature they may show many nrvcs in the peripheral blood so always keep an account ask for the age of the baby is it a premature child or not and then go ahead with your uh, understanding of the smear a 23 year case 23 is a five year old boy with jaundice again again low counts and 1,55,000 tlc so you would expect it to be possibly a luke when on the smear you find they're just full of nrbcs and this kind of a morphology of microcytic hypochromic is nothing but a thalassemia major so this was a thal major case uh, with uh, possibly in crisis showing extensive amount of nrbcs mainly you see a lot of polychromatic cells again it's acute hemolysis which is causing the leukoerythroblastosis so again a case that we saw some years back an 18 year old young boy who had come here as a construction worker jaundice and fever and again shift to left and nrbcs and the peripheral blood showed sickle cells so sickle cell in crisis can also show a leukoerythroblastic blood picture And this particular case of sickle cell, this was the marrow. This this was a post mortem. The child patient died within two three days, and uh, the history of sickle cell we saw it on the smear was not really elicited. So and because of the pan uh, the pancytopenia etc that was there, they did a post mortem marrow, and the marrow showed extensive amount of myelonecrosis, and the blood vessels were choked with sickle RBCs. So myelonecrosis can cause a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. Another case that we are seeing very, very regularly these days is post-chemotherapy patients with GCSF. You will find a lot of these toxic kind of change, cytoplasmic granules, shift to left, NRBCs and blasts. So it is very important when you are dealing with a case of acute leukemia, post-therapy or during monitoring of therapy, you find a picture like this, even if you see lots of blasts, please inquire about whether the patient has received GCSF. And if you see a picture with neutrophils, and a few shift to left, it's most probably GCSF, the regenerating marrow that is pulling out or pushing out the cells into the peripheral blood and causing this kind of picture. Okay, so keep this in mind. It can cause a florid leukoerythroblastic picture and so that could lead to a, a diagnostic issues at times. All right. So to sum up, leukoerythroblastic blood picture or reaction as we call it is a manifestation of myelophysic anemia and or extramedullary hematopoiesis. The literature, if you look at it really as I was going through, is scarce and heterogeneous. But whatever said and done, if you find a hematological abnormality like this in a background of malignancy, it is an indicator of disease progression associated with adverse prognosis and survival, poor survival. Peripheral smear is useful, as always, to look for the changes which helps you in the differential diagnosis, in which situation to do a marrow, in which situation not to do a marrow, rests entirely on the PS findings. Etiological causes are diverse. And in the order of frequency, uh, the first ones, hemolytic anemias, acute chronic blood loss, followed by what we discussed, granuloma, sepsis, myelomas, leukemia, and other, other uh, kind of infiltrative disorders. Frequently, it is a part of metastatic cancer and myelofibrosis. Thank you. At this, we sum up. And thank you very much, and stay safe, all of you. We'll get back. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Nadeem. And uh, Dr. Basu, I must compliment you. One of the one of the fantastic presentations and 
It's such a delight, I am sure, for all the postgraduates who have been who have logged in to see such variety of cases in leukoerythroblastic blood picture. And uh, almost 26 to 27 cases you have discussed, and uh, that that shows the experience. Even the quality of slides I saw the photographs were excellent. And so a big uh, thank you to you. Thank you. And uh, I, if I might just share. Last one month, we had two such cases. Mm. Uh, one was a 35-year-old lady who presented with bicytopenia. But when I saw the peripheral spear, I saw it was just autoimmune hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia, so it was Evans. Mm. I did a Coombs test twice and it was negative. negative. Because of the bicytopenia, I told them, Give a trial of steroid since it is AIHA, whom is mm -hmm. negative. Hemoglobin was 5, so the hemoglobin improved to 9, so everyone was happy. I was not. I insisted on a bone marrow. Why should a 35 year old lady with AIHA have a bicytopenia? And this being a medical college which is just growing up. So we finally got a CT scan done and we found an ovarian mass. But I went further because I had seen certain things in the marrow, uh, which the marrow came subsequently, they could not do a biopsy, so they did an aspirate. And it was fantastic, mucin secreting adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. So I went a step ahead and told them, do further CT scan and see, and they found a mass in the stomach. stomach. So it was a Kuchenberg's tumor actually, which actually presented as AIHA. Now the dilemma and why I'm discussing this case with you is, when I did serial five to six peripheral smears, it was the sixth peripheral smear on sixth consecutive day which showed a leuco blood picture. The first five peripheral smear was a classical AIH. Spherocytes, NRVCs, no left shift. We kept on doing it till they did the CT scan. I was not even aware of the CT scan, but I insisted on the marrow and the marrow showed metastatic identity. That was one case. And the second case was an interesting case again of a TTP. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So, thrombotic, thromboangiopathic, microangiopathic maha. So, it was a maha case in a young male. So, we started doing the plasma pheresis in this patient and we asked for an ADMTS 13 assay, which was negative. So, which, which was positive. That means ADMTS was decreased. Deficient, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, deficiency of ADMTS 13. So, we were very happy. So, this was maha with ADMTS 13. The fourth or the fifth peripheral smear showed leukoerythroblastic blood picture. So what I was trying to say is that I went on seeing the peripheral smear because there's nothing else to do. So went on seeing the peripheral smear on day one, day two, day three. On the good heavens, on day five, the LDH was high, of course, and then the leukoerythroblastic blood picture. And this patient had a metastatic carcinoma of the lung, mm -hmm. a non small cell carcinoma of the lung, which presented as a TTP with a deficiency of adamptins. And uh, the, uh, the plasma pheresis was successful, successful, but finally the diagnosis was this. So I suggest a serial examination of peripheral yes, smear. Yes, very true. Very yeah, true. because if you are really thinking of the leukocytic, it is sure to come. Yes, it may not come on day one or day two, but yes, it's generally very true. comes. Very true. So this is my limited experience, but I must compliment you because the plethora of cases you have seen, uh, you have shown, is a delight, and Thank I you. really salute you for a magnificent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Nadim. Over to you. Sir, not over to me. There are some comments on the chat box. I would love, I would ask you to just go through them and there are some questions as well. So you can put them to sir. Chat box. Uh, should okay. I help you? No, I have seen this. There's one question from Dr. Navanita. MCV for neonates, physiological versus disease related. And also NRVC cutoff for premature stroke, mature neonates. Sir, can you throw a little bit of more light on this? Uh, MCV, it's, it's a tricky area. MCV in neonates is definitely high always. It's about 100 and 110 in a neonatal MCV. Uh, so uh, if you are seeing just macrocytes, you take it as normal. If you are seeing it associated with polychromatic cells, yes, then that is, that is uh, an indicator of possibly there's some hemolysis going on. And as I said in my first slide itself, there are no really cutoffs. Premature infants, we have seen with NRBCs about 20, 25, up to 50. 100 WBCs. The younger the uh, the, the the younger the age, uh, it, it, you do see a lot of NRBCs there. Again, it all boils down to your clinical judgment and the peripheral smear finding. If you are finding obvious evidence of hemolysis, like schistocytes or 
spherocytes and other stuff yes then you think of a hemolytic disease otherwise in a premature uh, neonate uh, the nrbc's can be high but in a normal neonate not more than 5 definitely you do not find in normal uh, birth children uh, nrbc's are there but not not so many of them not so many of them so the only caveat only problem is in if it's a premature baby uh, those are the ones that you have to be careful about otherwise the cutoffs that are there for an adult is definitely there adult should not have an nrbc at all anything beyond beyond a one year of age there should not be nuclear nrbcs at all in a smear so that that's how i look at it uh two very very nice comments and which generally echoes what i have been trying to say an outstanding presentation that's is one thank you and mesmerizing <laughs> so this is a very good uh, comments from some of your some of the students here i don't see any more questions any more questions here yeah, i don't see questions yeah but uh, i think so uh, how to differentiate between yeah. dilated cyanocytes and adipocytes on trifine biopsy that is what dr isal wani wants to know dilated cyanocytes versus adipocyte well they would look different i suppose dilated cyanocytes would look different the shape would not be round always uh they would be surrounded by cells so a fat fat cell is usually not in single so uh, i'm not very sure i think it is not too difficult to pick up a dilated sinus from an adipocyte i don't know dr tathagat if you now that's a uh, fair enough and i must compliment you on that hodgkins lymphoma you presented and uh, surprisingly the nodular sclerosis variety is uh, common yes of late we are finding we are finding yeah. the nodular sclerosis is uh, Which, uh, uh, unfortunately, we are not getting too many uh, bone marrows for Hodgkin because anymore of, yeah. because of PET CT available PET CT. with us. So we are not getting it. We had a few cases of Hodgkin lymphoma bone marrow, but yes, about about two years, years ago, till two years ago, yeah. we were getting lots of. Uh, so yeah. we even were able to publish and present our findings. Yes. Of late, not too many Hodgkins are being subjected to marrow. Yes, very true. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, the days before the ISC actually came, it was. A quite nightmare to you know diagnose yeah, Hodgkin's lymphoma yeah, on the bone yeah. marrow, and we had various criteria for diagnosing it. And of course, the anaplastic last cell lymphoma, mm -hmm. the huge mimic, so particularly the bone marrow. So yes, we have to do a 30 positive, 50 negative, and a ALK. But I think the what you showed, the nodular sclerosis, it was really something because we have always been taught mixed cellular as mm -hmm. the commonest yeah. subtypes involving the bone marrow. Surprisingly, the other non-Hodgkin's lymphoma don't show so much of uh, leukoblastic blood picture. I mean, we're seeing the LBCL, ALCL in the marrow, yes. but somehow possibly they don't elicit too much of fibrosis or they are patchily present. Yes. Either they are normal hematologically, or they show at least anemia or maybe straight away pancytopenia when it's too much of infiltration. I have not really found too many leukoblastic picture in an NHL infiltrate, but Hodgkin's yes. Yeah. Okay, I think Mitodru has a question there. Mm -hmm. Storage disorders with secondary hemophagocytosis has been reported. Yes, has definitely been reported. Uh, Cancer. How do we differentiate? If your uh, primary clinical presentation is like a hemophagocytosis, you know, then it is mm -hmm. primary. Uh, storage cells will have its own. I mean, if there is a neurological manifestation, big spleen, yes, then we would think of storage. But. Clinically, and you can do the uh, the scoring for the hemophagocytosis, yes. hemophagocytic syndrome. That's available, so you could be able to differentiate between primary and secondary, I suppose. Yes, and the yes. morphology yes. of the storage cells, that is, Gaucher or Neyman pick, is different from the hemophagocytic macrophages. That you will have to appreciate. I think you know that uh, morphologically. Yeah, that's nice. And uh, I also saw one of your case of. Uh, Embryo or abdominal sarcoma? Yeah, yeah. Well, that particular, yes. Yeah. That particular yeah. photograph yeah. is very precious to me. Yeah, yeah, precious. Taken by my colleague who's no more, and uh, I remember her taking the photograph and giving it to me. So very nice. We recently had a mesentery abdominal sarcoma of the breast, actually, yeah. with uh, with uh, bone marrow involvement. So reminded me of this case. So mm -hmm. salute the, your colleague who actually photographed this case. Yeah. Yeah, Doctor Nadim. Yes, sir. I, I think I will take uh, the privilege of reading some of the comments, which is very important. Dr. Nabanita says, "Interesting cases, excellent images, cute cartoons, all lead to a yes. spellbound binding session." Yeah, that was very interesting. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yesterday I was just discussing, and my daughter, she of course is a literature English literature student, but she dabbles in all these cartoons, and she has her own comic strip that she is making. But she 
came back and just asked me what do these cells look like and uh, when i told her she came and presented me this little for pictures that she fantastic. drew herself and said it oh, that was nice interesting fantastic fantastic and dr manisha kango says outstanding presentation mesmerizing simplified with utmost clarity thank you sir thank dr. you ashish ranjan singh says thank you so much for sir for such a variety of cases dr gayatri from hyderabad perfect smear examination and follow up smear examination of ps very valuable diagnostic tool she also goes on to say dr basu and dr chatterjee have both illustrated this simple yet effective tool dr oh. navanita <laughs> says thank you sir it has you. helped her mita dru says thank you sir i think uh, that's it uh, just let me check on the youtube if there's anything else no there are none i think sir i think we come to uh, con- uh, to conclude this session thank you so much and uh, dr chaddiji and dr basu for being here and teaching us such with such wonderful cases and so valuable discussion thank you i think we'll close here bye bye good night take care okay, everybody bye bye good night sir good night